Good morning. Uh, we are here today at Think Tech Kauai with uh, Judge Gustavo Yelpi from uh, the District of Puerto Rico. He's the federal judge and he's been serving in that capacity for a while now. And he's also president of the, he's also past president of the Federal Bar Association. He was the first federal judge to become president of the Federal Bar Association and during his term, he led the federal bar to be much more active. In addition, I just want everyone to know that he was confirmed in his appointment by the President George W. Bush unanimously by the U.S. Senate. Uh, so that's quite a, an accomplishment and can give you an idea of what an exceptional person he is. So welcome, Judge Thank you. Gilby. Um, so pleasure happy, to be here. Happy to have you here. and. Uh, Judge Gelpi and I know each other through my late husband, Professor John Van Dyke, and both of them are very interested in the law governing the territories of the United States of America. Now, Hawaii, of course, is no longer a territory, it's a state, but Puerto Rico is still a territory. And uh, both Judge Gelpi and my husband have both written extensively about the unequal treatment of the territories, as well as uh, having taught in that area. Uh, so Judge Gelpi, I know that there's been some recent developments in the what we call the insular cases, which is the term used to describe the cases relating to the territories. And the recent developments have been just this year. So I was wondering if you could bring us up to date on the cases that are affecting Puerto Rico and how these recent developments, uh, how you interpret these recent developments. Well, uh, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me again. It's a pleasure being back here in Hawaii. Uh, well, uh, this just past summer, beginning in June, the Supreme Court issued uh, two very important opinions regarding uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, the last time it had issued opinions involving the constitutional uh, status of Puerto Rico within the United States had been uh, two, three decades ago. Uh, so two opinions came down, and then immediately after uh, these opinions, Congress also acted, which it had not acted this way since 19, before 1952, when the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico was created and uh, its constitution was approved by Congress and the people of Puerto Rico. So what, what occurred was early in June, the, the first case that came out of the, Puerto, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court was a case coming from the Puerto Rico Supreme Court. It's a case called uh, Commonwealth versus Sanchez Valle. Uh, in a nutshell, this case involved a prosecution originally by the federal authorities. The defendant pled guilty to weapons counts. Then at the state level, he was charged for those same exact weapons counts. Uh, the case went all the way to Puerto Rico Supreme Court. The Puerto Rico Supreme Court said it's double jeopardy. Uh, because the United States and Puerto Rico, uh, because Puerto Rico is not a state, they're considered a single sovereign for purposes of double jeopardy. Okay, let me just interrupt you there. So that so they're considered a single sovereign. So that means one governmental entity. Whereas, c can you compare that to, say, the state of Hawaii? Hawaii is a separate sovereign to the, the, the United States of America. The power of the United States derives from the states. Uh, what, what, what the theory of the Puerto Rico Supreme Court was that the power of Puerto Rico, even though it might have a constitution of its own, enacted by its people, approved by Congress, just like occurred in Hawaii, actually seven years after Hawaiian Alaska, seven years after the Puerto Rico Constitution was approved. Uh, but Puerto Rico, the Puerto Rico Supreme Court said that that constitution, the ultimate source of power, was ultimately the Congress of the United States. The case goes up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court resolves that in fact the U.S. and Puerto Rico for purposes of double jeopardy, that is, it's for single sovereign, it's one single sovereign. So if the federal authorities prosecute, the state authorities can't prosecute for that same offense or vice versa. And that's the first ruling that we have. So that's different for a state because if in Hawaii we could have prosecuted again for the same Yes, that, that same case would have taken place in Hawaii. The, fe the federal government could have prosecuted, sentenced the defendant, and then the state, authorities of, the state authorities of Hawaii could have prosecuted for that very same offense, and because they're two separate sovereigns uh, on equal footing, uh, they could both prosecute and sentence the defendant. And that could not happen in Puerto Rico because of its territorial status 
and the Sup United States Supreme Court's analysis. What the Supreme Court did was very inter interesting. It went on engaged in a historical analysis and the test, the Supreme Court of the United States said this is a historical test. Uh, this is going to be based on, on the history of, of Puerto Rico and the ultimate source of power, even though it has its constitution, everything derived from congressional acts, which ultimately led to that creation of that constitution. So for all purposes, for the double jeopardy clause, uh, it's a single sovereign. Contrary to Indian tribes, which pre-existed the, the nation. And in, and in that case, it distinguished the Indian tribes. Indian tribes, there's no double jeopardy. But for Puerto Rico, there is double jeopardy. So, uh, you know, the United States uses the ability to try people again uh, in cases, especially in civil rights related kinds of criminal cases where they think that for some reason the state didn't adequately prosecute. Well, that would have been, uh, for example, in the 90s, the Rodney King case. Uh, uh -huh. He was acquitted at the state level. Uh, the, the, the police officers, they were prosecuted by the federal authorities. Uh, if it were the same exact conduct under a federal and, and, and state statute, uh, in Puerto Rico, they couldn't be prosecuted. In any other state, they can. Uh, it, it's got its pros and its cons. You have to look at different commentators. Uh, some, some individuals uh, and academics uh, think it's fair that a person should not be prosecuted twice. Anyways, under They're any gonna, circumstance. Under any circumstance. Uh, there's actually a, this, a concurring vote by Justice Ginsburg uh, regarding that principle. Uh, two of the Puerto Rico Supreme Court justices, the Associate Justice, also they concurred in the result, but they felt that the Puerto Rico Constitution did not allow that sort of double prosecution. So it's very interesting. I interesting also, the Puerto Rico Supreme Court relied a lot on the insular cases. The U.S. Supreme Court does not mention the insular cases. It simply goes to the historical test uh, and recognizes that, that Puerto Rico does have a unique relationship with the United States. It's unprecedented, but nonetheless, it's a single sovereign. So uh, what? maybe you could just tell our audience what is what are the insular cases i know that you and i know quite well oh, yeah. since we could we, we could talk here area, yeah, we could be here for weeks and ages and but the insular cases are cases decided from uh, early 1900s all the way to 1922 by the supreme court and what these cases decide is that puerto rico and other overseas territories including in, hawaii including hawaii at some point because they're they're, they're what the ruling is that they're part but they're not really part of the United States. They're foreign in a domestic sense. They're part of the United yeah. States, but they're not. The Constitution does not follow the flag necessarily, except as the fundamental constitutional guarantees. Hawaii was what it's called an unincorporated territory <laughs> uh, for about two years until the Supreme Court said now it's incorporated by uh, by the 1900 Organic Act. Uh, Puerto Rico had its own Organic Acts in 1900, 1917, very similar to Hawaii. But the Supreme Court decided that Puerto Rico was not incorporated. And yes. then an incorporated uh, territory means it's destined for statehood. So it was really the Supreme Court who, who decided that Alaska and Hawaii were to become states. <laughs> Puerto Rico, uh, Virgin Islands, some of the other island territories were Guam. not to be Guam were not to become states. Uh, and it's, it's just based on judicial uh, Supreme Court interpretations. Congress has followed uh, that doctrine for all these many years. Uh, what is interesting is after the uh, Sanchez Valle decision, there was a second decision by the, uh, the United States Supreme Court. That one came out of my court, the U.S. District Court for the District of Puerto Rico, went up to the Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. That's called Franklin Trust. Uh -huh. uh, the issue was that in 1984, uh, Congress, for no apparent reason, it's, there's no legislative history whatsoever, uh, took Puerto Rico away from the benefits of Chapter 9's bankruptcy protection. So Hawaii can have instrumentalities or public mm -hmm. corporations or agencies that can uh, benefit, uh, you know, uh, from so, bankruptcy law. Well, I think we got to explain to our viewers what is Chapter 9 protection? Well, what is it that Puerto Rico is not well, being able to the have? The instrumentalities uh, in, in Puerto Rico cannot seek bankruptcy protection. So, uh, for example, uh, let's, let's assume a particular agency here or instrumentality of Hawaii, again, I'm not that familiar, but issues bonds. Uh, let's say the Hawaii power authority or the water authority or highway authority, uh, they issue bonds. Let's assume they're, they're, they're insolvent, they can seek bankruptcy protection. That bankruptcy protection was taken away from Puerto Rico in uh, 1984 uh, and it had never been an issue. Nobody complained about it until now that Puerto Rico uh, was faced with uh, uh, the fiscal crisis it's facing. It's, uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, well, we could go on for ages about that, but it's it's <laughs> really bad. really bad. You know, compared to Greece, <laughs> even basically. compared to Greece, it's bad. Compared to Greece or what's going on in Spain and, and, and some parts of Europe, but it's it's a very bad situation. So the problem is, uh, Puerto Rico could not avail itself of the bankruptcy law. It enacted its own bankruptcy law. The case goes to the federal courts. The federal court says under the supremacy clause, only Congress can enact bankruptcy laws. Uh, and they so have to be So is that uniform. your court that rules out? That's right. a colleague of mine. Uh, and he yes. was affirmed uh, uh -huh. by the Supreme Court, so I guess he was right. <laughs> and he knows he's right when he watches this. So uh, that was Judge Besosa. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Puerto Rico enacted its own bankruptcy law, but it was held unconstitutional. Uh, when the Supreme Court holds uh, that, uh, affirms that ruling, uh, what Congress then does, based on the aftermath of Sanchez Valle, the Franklin Trust case, and this is within weeks, Congress enacts what is known as the PROMESA statute. That's the acronym for PROMISE. Uh, it's, a, it, it cre it's an oversight act. It creates a fiscal board. And what Congress does, uh, relying on, 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 on Sanchez Valle and on, on the bankruptcy decision, it says that Puerto Rico, it's, it's legislating under the territorial clause. Uh, and creating this oversight board. It creates the equivalent of, of a bankruptcy law under the territorial clause for a territory, uh, but it's not Chapter 9, so it's not extending Chapter 9. I think Congress, the, well, the reason it doesn't uh, invoke Chapter 9 is, or, or extend it then to Puerto Rico is then it says, well, then the states are going to start going into bankruptcy or, you know, what, what's going to happen? Uh, if, if, you know, so they, they just didn't want to create a president that would apply to states. So they create this special bankruptcy law to Puerto Rico and create an oversight board. And the oversight board, uh, in a nutshell, they have powers under federal law uh, that, for example, if the governor-elect now when he comes into power has any executive orders or any actions that have anything to do with the, the fiscal status of Puerto Rico or the legislature adopts a budget or anything that's fiscal in nature or could even extend to a Puerto Rico Supreme Court decision that interprets the fiscal status of Puerto Rico, that oversight board has the authority to trump or to, to stay that uh, act by the local government. So, uh, so, so it, it did, it, do people in Puerto Rico view the legislation as something that's going to be helpful to Puerto Rico? And did the legislation come with any financial support for Puerto Does it, Rico? Well, there's no financial support in the legislation. Okay. Uh, the governor of Puerto Rico and the congressman, who is now stepping down, uh, both requested the legislation. They felt it was the only way to move Puerto Rico forward. Uh, so is the congressman, your congressman doesn't get a vote, is that correct? He doesn't get a vote. He gets to, the, the congressman in Puerto Rico is elected for four years, uh, and it's one congressman for the work of five congressmen. He doesn't have a right to vote. He's got a voice, but doesn't get to vote. Uh, <laughs> and it's very similar to the congressman that Hawaii had before Hawaii became a state. So it's yeah. that exact, exact relationship. But uh, why does Puerto Rico then have a full court? You have an Article Three court in Puerto Rico, which is equivalent to the same kind of federal court that we have here yeah. in Hawaii, uh, but you don't have a congressperson who can vote. So why yeah. is there that distinction? Well, that's that's a very good question. Uh, the, the federal court, Congress created an Article Three court pursuant to its uh, power under Article Three of the Constitution to create federal inf inferior federal courts to the Supreme Court. Uh, it's the first time, the only other federal court, every time a, 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 a territory became a state, in the Admission Act, there the Congress would create a federal court. For example, in Hawaii, when Hawaii becomes a state in 59, you get a, you know, an Article III federal court. And Article III, for those who don't know, it means that the judges have life tenure. Uh, they cannot be removed except impeached uh, for, for, for just cause. Uh, but what's interesting in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico has always had a territorial court. Uh, Hawaii and Alaska got their federal courts, and sometime in 1966, the Congress, based on recommendations of the Judicial Conference of the United States and the United States Department of Justice recommended to the Congress that Puerto Rico get a court just like any state. And the legislative history says, well, Puerto Rico is just like any other state. It's not a state admitted to the Union, but it's got its three branches of government. Uh, there's a lot of litigation between the federal government and the state government, and there's no reason why uh, litigants shouldn't get in Puerto Rico uh, the benefits of an Article III court. And that's why the court was created so for purpose of the judicial branch, federal and state judiciary, Puerto Rico is just like any other state. But insofar as the, the legislative branch, insofar as the right to vote for president and vice president, for example, I was not able to vote in this election. 
Uh, I had previously voted in Massachusetts when I lived there twice. Uh, one time I was living in D.C. I voted there for president. No congressmen or senators there. Uh, but in Puerto Rico, I moved back to Puerto Rico, I can't vote for president. I'm, I'm, I have a constitutional impediment because it's not a state. There's no electoral college. Uh, okay, interesting. So we're interesting. Gonna, we're going to take a short break, but we're going to come back to that issue because I think that's a very important issue that, um, you know, you do pay taxes, federal taxes in Puerto Rico, but you cannot vote for well, president. Well, I, I pay federal taxes. Not all people pay federal okay. taxes. So that's, that's another interesting issue. <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. So we're going to take a short break right now, and uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes to continue our discussion with uh, Judge Gustavo Yelpi from Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. We're back to continue our discussion with Judge Gustavo Yelpi from the District of Puerto Rico, uh, the federal court there. And we were just talking about the fact that people in Puerto Rico do not get the right to vote for the United States president, although when Judge Gelpi was residing in Massachusetts, he did get to vote for the United States president. So I really wanted to follow up on that. I mean, how does that work? I don't understand how well, you could vote for the president when you were in Massachusetts, but you couldn't vote for the president when well, you were in Puerto by, Rico. I'm a U.S. citizen by birth, but by I was born in Puerto Rico. Uh, I moved to Massachusetts while I studied. Uh, I was there all those years, uh, in, the, in the late 80s, in the 80s and 90s, so I was able to vote for president because I was residing there at an apartment, so I had license, so I could vote there. Uh -huh. I didn't vote in Puerto Rico, of course, uh, but then when I go back to Puerto Rico, because it's not a state, it does not have an electoral college, I lost that right to vote. In mm -hmm. Interestingly, when I was nominated by President Bush, I was confirmed by the Senate unanimously, and interesting, uh, the, uh, President Obama was a senator, so when they called the roll vote, he voted <laughs> to <laughs> confirm me. Uh, uh -huh. uh, so, uh, but it's it's interesting. I could not vote for senators or congressmen or you know not the well the senators who confirmed me or nor for the president who confirmed me. So that's quite an irony. Uh, yes. At the same time, as an Article Three federal judge, for example, if the president were to enact any le you know enforce any legislation, or I, I I could rule that some legislation is unconstitutional, which I haven't ruled. <laughs> it's never happened. But one of my predecessors many years ago enjoined the president of the United States. That's when Jimmy Carter was president. He enjoined him twice. He has that power, but he could never vote for the president of the United States. So it's one of these ironies that, that you get in what, living for territory. Well, so, what about, like, for instance, Guam? Are people in Guam U.S. citizens? Oh, they're, they're U.S. The only place where uh, folks who are born in, within the United States territories are not U.S. citizens is uh, American Samoa. They're considered nationals. They're not citizens. They owe allegiance to the United States, but they they don't have the cloak of citizenship, and that's kind of one one of these interesting um, mm -hmm. judge-made rules from the Supreme Court <laughs> early part of the century. Puerto Rican residents before Congress in 1917 granted citizenship to people in Puerto Rico were also U.S. nationals. They, I see. They, 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 they're not citizens of any other nation, but they're not citizens of the United States. They're nationals. So it's one of the... Yeah. Something you had mentioned was interesting, uh, whether in Puerto Rico uh, individuals pay personal uh, federal income tax. Mm -hmm. uh, you do pay, of course, Medicare, uh, Social Security tax, just like any citizen of any state. Import and export taxes are paid federally. Uh, if I have federal income, I, as a federal judge, I have to pay federal income tax or anybody who has see. a contract with the United States government or federal agency or, you know, uh, commodity taxes or anything. Interesting, Puerto Rico... It was maybe four or five years ago, but the statistic I had generated more federal revenue from taxes, even though most people, because of the poverty level also, and they don't have federal income, they don't pay federal taxes. Uh, Puerto Rico made more, uh, I think, more than one state and almost as much as two other states. So <laughs> it still generates money for the U.S. Treasury. Yeah. Well, I noticed another thing that you've mentioned before, too, is that you have a very high percentage of your population that enlists in the United States military. Yeah, it's, it's one of the highest uh, per capita jurisdictions. I think uh, Samoa uh, and yeah. Guam are pretty high, although they're much smaller jurisdictions. So yes. it, it, the numbers are look even higher. Uh, but it's, 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 it's a very big number. Uh, we have a lot of people in the armed forces. Those individuals move back to Puerto Rico. They can never vote for their commander in chief either. So yeah. <laughs> one of those ironies from living in a territory. So another thing I want to ask you about, which I thought was similar to Hawaii, is that... Uh, you had an island in Puerto Rico that the U.S. Navy was using for bombing Yeah, that, that was, there were two islands. Originally it was Culebra, where Culebra means snake, and the other island is Vieques. It's a small island, uh, yes. and uh, people actually live there, but Vieques had like, maybe I think like a third of the island or half the island. Uh, 
uh, and the Navy is no longer uh, doing bombing practices there. There's, it's, it's moved out of there. But so that, have people moved in? Well, people have moved in. There's tourism. I don't know. The, I haven't been there for a long time. The economy, yeah. uh, it, yeah. it's, it's very bad, just like in other parts of Puerto Rico. Tourism, there's times when it's high, times when yeah. it's low. But in terms of the, uh, the place where they were actually doing bombing practice, is that livable? Because here... We have Cajolave that they use for bombing practice, but we're not, nobody's able to. I'm not there. the super environmental expert. Uh, I've oh, okay. seen parts of the Navy base uh, have been yeah. turned back to the government yeah. of Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm not an expert on environmental matters, but I think the bombing there took so long. Uh, there, I don't think there's been a mega cleanup there. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. But again, don't take my word for granted, but I, I, I don't think there's, there's been perhaps some money's given to the Commonwealth uh, for, for, you know. Yeah. But, but I, I don't know what's the situation there exactly. And there haven't been many issues after the Navy left out. Uh, <laughs> okay. At least no lawsuits for cleanup <laughs> so far. So far. So I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the Federal Bars Association as well, because I was president, as you know, of the Hawaii chapter here of the Federal Bar Association. And you were president uh, of Na the I was national. Na I was national president, and before that in 2000, I was president of the Puerto Rico chapter. Okay, so maybe you could just tell us, you know, kinds of some of the things that you were doing while you were president, and, uh, you know, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the Federal Lawyer Magazine, which I know you've written for right. before. Well, and I want to make sure that we save a little bit of time to talk about Panama as well. Oh, okay. okay. Well, the, uh, the Federal Bar Association is a national association. Uh, its members are, in large majority, federal practitioners and federal judges. Uh, the purpose of the association is to promote the rule of law, strengthen uh, federal uh, relationships between the bar and bench, and to promote academic discussion of issues uh, that are going on uh, at the national level, which impact the federal practitioner and the federal courts. For example, uh, the year before I was president, the, there was a sequestration issue, and the federal bar uh, lobbied, and, and obviously the judges who were there, we, we can't lobby, we're ethically precluded, but yes. the other members of the bar association and the board and it's got uh, its representatives uh, go before the, the Congress and, and explain how this was affecting the courts, that the courts needed to be open uh, to carry out uh, justice. You know, be, and, and there's civil criminal cases moving on. Uh, other things like, for example, when I was president uh, in that was three years ago, it was the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act and, 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 and the Criminal Justice Act, which is the law that guarantees that everybody charged in federal court who cannot afford an attorney will get an attorney of quality. Uh, to represent him uh, and creates a federal public defender's office. So I, I went on a sort of like a national uh, tour mm -hmm. and I went to, you know, different locations and we would speak about the importance of, of, of the Criminal Justice Act, the Civil Rights Act, uh, and so forth. Uh, I've also lectured through the federal bar in different chapters. I've been here in Hawaii, Alaska, in Massachusetts, Chicago, I think Orlando, in Puerto Rico talked about the, the, the situation about the, the territories of the United States. And the federal bar promotes that sort of discussion, which is more academic uh, uh -huh. in, in, perp in, in purpose. Uh, right now, the pre current president is uh, Magistrate Judge Michael Newman from the United States District Court in the Southern District of Ohio. Uh, and his uh, idea for this year is to promote civics throughout, you know. So he's here in Hawaii. Actually, the Federal Bar Association Hawaii Chapter Conference will take place tomorrow. Uh, and we're both going to be in a panel. And it's to engage the bar and the bench and, and, and promote the rule of law. And uh, Yes. And well, you have written about the insular cases and some oh, of these yeah. issues there's that a, we've There's a magazine. About. It's a very good. Those are not members of the federal bar since nobody from Hawaii practices before me. I can encourage you to join. <laughs> there might be still space to go to the conference tomorrow. I'm not going to be talking about the federal case, uh, the, the insular cases. I'm going to be talking about the amendments to the rules of civil procedure. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it's got a magazine called The Federal Lawyer. Uh, it, it's always open for, for attorneys or judges to send uh, articles. It's not law review articles. They're not like 100, 200 pages long. They're usually four or five page articles. Uh, one of the, art, the big issues we had when I was president along with Mike, Michael Newman, Judge Newman, was to uh, have a special issue dedicated to the role of magistrate judges and the importance of magistrate judges uh -huh. uh, uh, in, in the federal courts. Magistrate judges are judges. They're not appointed for life. Uh, they're appointed by the court for a term of years. But they work very hard for the court, and uh, without them, we could not do our business. <laughs> so they, 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 they really help us. And that was very important for me to get that message out, and that's the sort of thing the federal bar does. Uh, yeah, so let's just uh, take the last few minutes we have to return to those absolutely fascinating insular cases and 
the differential treatment of the territories. And I know that you re recently wrote an article about uh, the Panama Canal and how, uh, how the United States treated the Panama Canal zone as, as part of its territories and, and the differing uh, treatment there. So I, I was well, wondering if you could give us just a, yeah. a well, brief, brief review of what happened. Yeah, well, it was very, very interesting because, uh, and I became very interested. I happened to go to Panama over the summer for a basketball tournament. Uh, which was about for 10 days, and in that time I knew there had been a federal court there, so I, it was able to have the embassy folks take me down there. I took some photographs, uh, uh, and I researched, I got some, read a lot of history, and it was very interesting because the canal zone from 1904 to 1979, when the treaty was signed to give it back, uh, was a U.S. territory in the middle of Panama. It's just imagine having, you know, the middle of Hawaii become a federal territory, and and Hawaii being a kingdom, and all of a sudden, you know, just imagine that the, the center of Hawaii was a federal territory, and, and, and Hawaii still a nation, independent nation. And that's what happened in, in Panama. There was a military base. Obviously, the United States under President Roosevelt constructed the canal. The interest, to, the interest of President Roosevelt was to connect the Atlantic and the Pacific, because obviously its fleet could go through there. Mm -hmm. you, you, the United States could have naval supremacy. Uh, and that was one of the, 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 the important issues, like whoever had control of that canal would have control of, yeah. of, you know, of the globe. Uh, so it was very interesting, and the United States had that territory for close to 60, 70 years. Uh, also, uh, the United States has a former territory, was the Philippines, and those are the two territories which the United States eventually, the Philippines, became an independent nation, and the c canal zone was returned to p the, the nation of Panama, the Republic of Panama. Uh, but aside from that, all the other territories, what I sort of done in the article I wrote, that was one of my last mm -hmm. articles, was to contrast all the other territories, the ties between the territories and the United States government have strengthened. In those, uh, in, in, you know, for example, in, in the Canal Zone, the people born there, some were citizens, like President, uh, well, Senator McCain. Yeah, of course. He didn't become uh -huh. president, but that was one of the issues when he was president. But th there was issues regarding citizenship, and you had to be a citizen, a, a, a child of at least one American parent to be a citizen, uh, and the rules, you know, the, the, the rules that in every state apply, when we're born, we're citizens, or what constitutional rights apply or not in, in the territories, they're very different. And it gives the, the Congress flexibility, you know, in, in the case of, uh, of, of, of the Philippines, to basically de-annex the Philippines and let them become an independent country. In the case of Panama, return it to another nation. And I guess in the case of Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Guam, Marian Islands, there's a more permanent relationship uh, moving on forward. Uh, and, and again, none of these in Panama, there was a big movement to return Panama also to the nation. Uh, Philippines also, they really didn't want to become part of the United States. In the other island territories, uh, in Puerto Rico, we have a statehood and a Commonwealth party. They're the majority parties, but if you put them together, it's basically a, a very large number of, you know, 80, 90 percent, you know, close to 90 percent of the folks who want to have some sort of permanent relationship with the United States, regardless of how the situation is. So as to these territories, the Congress continues to, to legislate, work with them. Uh, we've seen PROMESA, the, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, I, I assume at some point uh, it's only been in force for the last two months, I believe. The, the Oversight Board has already started acting. Uh, there may be cases before the federal court, before the U.S. Supreme Court, and again, maybe next year, the following year, I can come and give a synopsis of those. Uh, <laughs> who knows, I might end up uh, having one of those before me, and then it will go up on appeal. <laughs> so do you have an independence movement in Puerto Rico? There is, there? A, there is an independence movement. It, it's, the votes in this last election were not enough for the party to remain as a party, so they have to reinscribe the party. Uh, this has been happening for the last maybe four or five electoral periods. Uh, so uh, they, they did get a seat in the Senate and a seat in the local house, but as a party, they d did not garnish enough votes. Uh, and interesting this year, we never had that before. There were like two independent candidates, and one got, you know, uh, you know I think, maybe, I don't have the exact numbers, but one got, I think it was 160, 170,000 votes, and it took a lot out of the statehood and the Commonwealth Party. Uh, how exactly, everybody can argue <laughs> one way or another, but I think also there's electors who, you know, look to independent people who are not involved in status politics. So that might be one, you know, that look to social issues. So it's, again, I'm not a sociologist or a politician, so I, I can't explain that phenomenon. But it was very interesting in this election because I, you know, I, I don't think anybody figured, except for her, that she was going to get so many votes. And, <laughs> and she basically, like, 
uh, President-elect Trump was using social media f to, to get out to the younger mm -hmm. people, to a lot of people. So uh, it's going to be interesting both in the mainland and, uh, and, and even in Puerto Rico and I think in the other states how elections from now on are going to be carried. So that's part well, of democracy, I guess. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Well, my uh, pleasure. Thank you uh, for coming and, and, and sharing and your valuable time. With my limited knowledge of Hawaiian language, but I know mahalo nui loa. <laughs> thank you very mahalo much. Mahalo nui loa to you, Judge Thank Gandhi, you very much. And, and, uh, we hope to see you here in Hawaii again soon. Oh, so do I. <laughs> so thank you. thank you all from Think Tech Hawaii for putting on this show, and uh, we hope to see you again soon.